doing the label, label away so I'm not advertising any specific supplement <laughs> You know this last song that is, we, we, we sing, you know, being thrown upon the praises of, of a thousand generations. And it's lucky to sing it and it flows nicely and it's, you know, it's all those, all those cool things. But you actually know that it's true. That's what it's like. That what you're singing is true. Mm -hmm. That out of, out of every God in existence that's come and gone and has changed shape, name, face, whatever, since the first man, up until now, the name of Yahweh has always been worshipped. Many other gods have come and gone. But this dude actually really sits in the throne in the presence of a thousand generations. Just maybe something to consider. You know, even if you're not uh, in the end, it's spiritual. So just historically, you know, like mm -hmm. factually, mm -hmm. people have been worshiping this specific world since the beginning. Mm -hmm. In any case, we, we, we blessed that the God is serving isn't far away. Mm -hmm. We blessed that this God loves us. He blessed that this God gives vision. He blessed that he gives hope. Mm -hmm. Now, on my way here, I was reminded that I went to, to Bahrain. I don't know if you guys know where Bahrain is. It's in the Arabian world. It's a small island. About 60, I think 60 kilometers by 25 kilometers or 40 kilometers. Um, <coughs> they used to start the Formula One season. It's a nice track. Yes, it is. Got some cool crowds every long time. Mm -hmm. And that's it. like an advertisement because it's all the sponsors on one t shirt. <laughs> so, in any case, it was a nice visit. It was a nice visit. But the reason why I'm going to tell you about Bahrain is not about the, the, the city there. If you drive out into the desert, into the middle of nowhere, there's this tree. Now they call it the tree of life. Now I suppose it's the only uh, apt name to give it. It's not really the tree of life that the Bible talks about. Yes. But there's nothing special about this tree. It's just a normal tree. It's got some weird long branches and stuff, but it's not like huge. It doesn't have a stem this thick and you know, like whatever. It's just, it's a, it's just a, another tree. But what's special about it is there's nothing else that grows around it for kilometers. It's just desert. Hmm. Not Karoo like desert, I mean like desert desert. But nothing that's same. Remember, it's an island surrounded by a sea. Okay, so it also just can't be like, you know, it just has really deep roots and it tucks into like that. You know, mm -hmm. obviously it hits a water line somewhere, but the thing is, nothing else is growing. Only And people drive from all over. If you go and visit Bahrain, you often go there. You go check out the spot. If you make a cross to the 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 one and And there's many spots like that across the world that people don't see. Like the Grand Canyon and the like body rocks. And it's not about the tree. For me, I believe it's not about the tree. So the tree is not the reason people go. People go and see those things because it, it, it generates something, it stirs something deeper inside of you that, that something, that the impossible is possible. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's, it's something that is highly unlikely and for all, all practical purposes simply impossible to exist in that. It's there. You touch it. 
So it speaks to that part of a person that, that wants to dream about something different from what they have. You're welcome to disagree with me on this, like I say, it's my thoughts on it. But why else would I drive out into the desert to go see a tree that I can just go and, and see in my garden? If it's not a special tree at all. At all. So it has to be about something that is deeper. You know when you're at school and you dig this chick, and you go to whatever party she's at, you can dig a chick up. No, of course not. Secretly, I hope in the same class this year. Everybody else is just an amateur. Or another dude. He's only in the chick to get on <laughs> I'm 40, I've come around that year. <laughs> it's just that 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 grandma of hope in spite of everything. And maybe maybe that that's what it is, is 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 hope. And maybe it's it's what the word of God says. It says that hope doesn't it says this. <coughs> doesn't disappoint me. Yeah. This hope doesn't fail me. Yeah. Who's had a, you know in Proverbs it says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah. But who's experienced that? Yeah. Who's, who's like had your hope set on something and then just like yeah. it falls and, and no one else in the world just notice that your hope crash, came crashing down. You know it's like only your that the like, you know, just went, That's a really nice job. But there's one hope that, that just doesn't, doesn't disappoint them. And, it, and it's this hope that, listen, if any of you had an easy year this year, fantastic, and we had a year. Those of us that, that live in the real world where we process what's actually happening, for a lot of us, it was actually a terrible year. We were challenging us. And a lot of weird stuff happened, and a lot of Hectic stuff happened, and a lot of other stuff happened, there was always stuff happening. And, you know, but the only reason why, why we can walk through it with, with, and still look the world in the eye with confidence is because of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's why I do it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to lie to myself and tell myself everything is okay. I can tell myself stuff is just not okay right now. But the God I believe in is always the Son. And if He says He's going to be there for me, He's going to be there for me. If He says mercy is going to be every morning, then you every morning. If He says He's got a plan and a purpose for me, then He's got a plan and a purpose for me. Sitting down, standing, walking, whatever. But one day, one day, God just stood me and said to me, Because my children are bound by time <coughs> and bound by purpose. And, and what he meant, what he, what he was saying to me there is, 
is because don't worry that you're running out of time <laughs> to fulfill your purpose. Don't worry that, that things are going to come to an end before you get there. And, and, I, and I don't want to say that you've got all the time in the world because the Word of God says redeem the time yes. because the days are evil. But some of us have wasted decades of our lives. Yes. And we fear and, and we think to ourselves, what's the point of starting because I've wasted so much time? And surely if this was my purpose from birth, surely I, I missed out on all the training I should have had and on all the opportunities I should have had and, and on everything else I should have had to be able to fulfill that. So we just don't bother starting. You know, we start in the first word of, 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 of um, resistance, we, uh, you know, it's not meant to be, you know, we just it's too late. It's too late. It's not too late. You see, because the thing is, God says, you can restore the years to like this is like mm -hmm. Amen. It says that in its time, we will do it swiftly. When the time for something comes, God is the ability to just put you there. <clears throat> you know, like it's, uh, I, I will never refer back to physical exercise or lessons because it's ladies. So let me go there. Let me go to study. You study at the university. You, do, you study for six years, you get your master's, you, get, you become a, a CA or whatever you do. Or any way you go to work with numbers every day of your life. That's really good for you. Um, I struggle with that kind of thing. But, but if you. You study for six years, and in, in six years, nothing has changed in your life. You can go to the same building every day for six years. That's a tiring thing to do. And every year, the work gets more and more complicated and more difficult. And now you know by year five or six, you don't just have to do your studies, which is no more. Now you have to write a thesis and then you have to do practicals on top of studying. So now you have to put up with a boss that's an idiot and, and you know and, and all these other things and these emotional things as well as studying. So I'm just saying the boss is an idiot because that's the most people feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, those bosses are actually there for a reason. It's the But uh, everybody feels that way. You know. So, so the thing is, for six years you've done, you've done nothing different. You've just done the same thing every day you study. But you know, that next year, everything changes. That next year, because you've been doing what you should have been doing for the past six years, opportunity opens up. <coughs> and then it was worthwhile. If you're not relating what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is in your journey now in life, it's not about studying, it's about anything else. If you go through the stuff that life is going to throw at you, you're going to allow life to build character into your own life, to just shape you. You know, get rid of that, that, that ugly facade that we carry in and just become that beautiful person that you are. When God wants to move you where He wants you, you're ready for it. You're ready for it. And there's no door that is so close that God cannot open. Mm -hmm. You know what he did with Jesus after Jesus got resurrected? Jesus just walked through the mm -hmm. The disciples were closed in the door, afraid that someone's going to come and arrest them or whatever else. So they were sort of chilling in this room and the door was closed. So Jesus just came walking through the wall. God we serve. You know, Peter, if you, if you don't believe me, you need to understand that Peter, for three and a half years, walked with Jesus. And after that, he denied him. You know, and that, Peter was not a, a pussy. Peter was a fisherman. He was a, a hardened guy. He was weather hardened. 
He was not a soft guy. He was a, he was a tough person. Okay? He, he was also not a, an eloquent speaker. <laughs> he was a ruffian. So, so for three and a half years, I mean, like, this guy's gone out on, on, on missions, you know, with, with his partner. You know, Jesus sent him out twice, two by two. You know, he's done that. And, and, and uh, when the guys came to raise Jesus, he chopped off the guy's ear. And, you know, so he wasn't like, like a softy. He was like a deal of action. But after three and a half years, I'm thinking if, if Peter knew that Jesus was about to betray Jesus, <coughs> Jesus wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that. Because that's just how I picture uh, Peter, you know, he's quite a savage. But, uh, in any case, so, so the lady, a lady comes and asks him, aren't you one of these, these guys? And, and he says, no way. <laughs> you know, it happens two more times after that. Every time it's just keeps going. And then the, the rooster grows, and then he realizes, ah, I betrayed Jesus, and it's so bad. And within 40 days, Jesus restores him. You don't read about Jesus tuning Peter, how bad he was and, and all of that. He said, when he comes back to when, when Jesus and, and Peter encounter each other again, he says to Peter, you know, do you love me? You see, three times Peter denied Jesus. So three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And every time after Peter, first Peter said, yes, you know that I love you. And then he said, feed my lambs or whatever. And we're going to get taken for a lot. And he said, lambs or sheep or whatever. That's the whole other thing. We can go on about that. But the second time he says again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, I love you. And Jesus says, again, feed my lambs. And the third time he says, Peter, do you love me? And, and, and Peter just says, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I am. And then he says, you know, you must you. And he restores him right there in front of everybody. Instead of saying, now you have to walk, you have to work in your repentance and you have to do all these things, then I will. Right there and then he says to him, feed my sheep. In other words, I'm enough for you, I've restored you, I'm enough for you, do what you're supposed to do. And you know, within, within 50 days of Jesus being resurrected, Peter preaches his first public message. And a few thousand people come to the world. that's a lot of That's like two big high schools. Fifty days after he completely denied that he knows him. Well, fifty-three days. That's incredible. How long do we disqualify ourselves from? How long do we allow our, our past or our events in our lives to steal our hope? Do we allow Jesus to restore it to us quickly? Because that's what he does. You know, when he says, My mercy is on you every morning, he says to you, You have hope. I, I had this cool revelation in one day that one of the things that changed my life. I've got some of these moments throughout my life that um, it just changed my way I see, see the world and I see myself in it. Um, and I know Derek used to call it the finding moments. It was just, it was one day when I actually realized that as long as I have air in my lungs, I have hope. There's a chance for me to do it different and better. There's a chance for me to move forward. The only time when hope is gone is, is when this is no longer, this, the air is no longer moving in and And I realized that about who God is. So when I wake up in the morning, I breathe and find God.
Doesn't matter where you are right now. Doesn't matter how you see yourself right now. <coughs> God always has and always will see you only one way. Amen. Amen. One way. That's how we see you. And in my life, the course is probably. Oh no, I can't really do my own. But I still see my life. So that hope, that, that thing that, that, that if everything else in your life is a better, it is with, the word of God says that, that when, you know, when, when, when we become faithless, we remain faithful. Why? It just does that next passage there, does it say, so if you can feel better, <laughs> so that you can be there for you? Is that what it says? No, it's not what it says. It says because he cannot deny himself. It is who it is. He remains faithful because he is a faithful God. He cannot compromise who he is. Now that doesn't give you hope. If you meditate on that, and it doesn't ignite a bit of hope in you. Man, because when I read the Bible and I see he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the more familiar I become with the Bible, actually, as you read it, you see how the New Testament played off in the Old Testament. You see all, all the prophetic types and all the references and how Jesus just became the actual living being of all this, all this stuff that is said over here and lived out over generations. The more you realize that he's just, he's just who he is, he's, he's just so incredible. And if he says he's faithful, then that's exactly what he's going to be. If he said he has a plan, then that's exactly what he has, without previous knowledge. His plan does not depend on my understanding. Either the work of the cross was complete or it wasn't. Was. You see, Jesus can't lie, so when he, when, he, when he died, he said, it's finished. So it's finished. It's finished. I don't have to earn his faith, I just have to walk in his faithfulness. There's hope, man. I just, my life is just going to give you a bit of hope because that's a scare, one of the scarcest commodities in the world today. <laughs> you can look at any country, any country. You see criticism, judgment, uh, despair, um, violence. Huge levels of anxiety. You see it everywhere. You don't see hope. You don't see hope. People are fighting for hope. They're fighting for hope. To fulfill breath, you know? So, so Jesus gives that hope. He gives that hope for us. I can be as confident today as I'll ever be. Because my confidence rests in what he says. My confidence he wants. Hope is like a little iron. You get it. <laughs> but it was not good. Put it down as a record. <laughs> That's something I need to try all the days myself. Okay. 
thing to find the thing that makes us come alive. We need to find it. Get in front of it. Look for it. I promise you it's not at the bottom of the bottle, but at the end of the crack line, but in the house. Something that just naturally sits you. Something that naturally makes you feel like you can fly. You can invest in it. I feel a strong need to qualify this stuff. Otherwise, people are going to go here and they're going to tell their sponsors and whatever else, I'm not going to work until I find this thing. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to qualify that stuff. Mm. So if you want to be perspective, I don't know what I'm saying. Paul's passion was to preach the word of God. Mm -hmm. It was his outright passion. He was put together for it. Because even before he became saved, he studied for 30 years under the most gifted teacher of the word of God at that stage called Gamaliel. When Gamaliel died, they said the teaching of the Torah died with him. Okay. So, so he had the best teacher of the time teaching him the Old Testament, their Bible. And he was passionate about that because he even helped persecute people in order to defend it. Okay. So his passion never changed. You must understand that if God didn't change Paul's passion, he simply redirected it to where it should be. He aligned his passion with the truth and, and then Paul flourished. Yeah. So we must understand that, that this is, it's important for you to know it because we think that our passions are wrong. But we get it wrong because we align it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, so but Paul's passion was, was the word of God and, and getting people to understand the goodness of God and the hope that God has and, and the love that God has for them and, and the life that God has for them. But you know what Paul did for money? He made things. You'll read, he says, I make tents so that I don't have to be a burden on anybody else. Mm -hmm. So apart from Paul's passion, he also had another talent. You see, the one talent, the one was to live out his passion, the other one was to generate the funds for his passion. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. okay. So don't go and say, I'm just going to run off to my passion and, and you know, steer everything else and everybody else has to carry the financial load until you get to your viable passion. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Invest in your passion. Pursue your passion. But use all the other gifts and talents that you have to generate a place where that passion becomes viable. Please, don't neglect all the other things that God gave you just for the sake of your, your primary thing. Because mm -hmm. you have all of those other things for a reason. Yeah. You begin. Mm -hmm. yeah. The word of God says that a man's gift will make room for him. Mm -hmm. It says that he is diligent will stand before great men. He will not stand before unknown people. So, use your gifts and be diligent in it. There's hope in that. And that's what God gave you. To open a door for you. To generate room for you. If you feel a space is too crowded, it's because you're not walking in your gift. You're following the car. It's going to get crowded. No. Walking in gift makes you... You don't have to defend it, it's yours. <coughs> so 
Go back to the right seat. Continue with my own wrist. Address the new guy here. So I'm still at 713. It says, and we've lost heart. And they say, we'll leave. I would see the goodness of the Lord in the name of My hope lies in this that whenever bad things are happening in my life, I trust and I meditate on what is good, pure, true, lovely, noble. Good report and praise the Lord. I process the rest and I do what I can about it. And then I think about the stuff that I should be thinking about. It keeps my legs strong and my head clear. Why? Because I hope, I trust that what God says, my hope is my trust in God because I trust Him when He says I'm supposed to do this. And I have to think about these things. He's not unaware of my life. He's fully aware of my life. But He says, dude, if you want all your energy to be gone, Think about the bad stuff. Go for it. Think about it. But if you want to walk with energy, if you want to walk with, with, with perseverance and with strength, then think about what is good and pure and true and lovely and noble and excellent. Think on those things. And then we all know Philippians 4.13 where, where God says that, that uh, it's through Christ Jesus that we can strength. No? But I can do all things. But not. So I swapped that whole thing around. <laughs> I said the same thing. But we don't, you know what Philippians 4 12 says? The verse just before it. It says, I've learned the secret to be content in everything. In every situation, whether I base or bound, clothes or make hungry or well fed. I can do all things through Christ Jesus and Jesus Christ. God is in peace with the strength because I think about everything that is good, pure, true, and I know what I'm doing. That's five verses. But you might have this magical moment to have it. It's, it's all there. It's all there. It's all there. The Word of God. He says it, and I believe it. Everything pertaining to life and godliness is found within the Word of God. That's my hope. And it hasn't failed me. And my life has taken some whack out to me. Not of my own accord. One or two or three or three. <laughs> but some things that just life just, just throws at you. But my hope is not sure. My hope is not sure. Trust. 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 It's a difficult thing for us sitting in the seat. Because we don't trust ourselves, I think, if we get a sense of it. Once you don't, you, you can trust yourself, it's much easier to trust other people. You don't have that natural defense. Doesn't mean you're stupid, it just means you're mm -hmm. By the way, if you trust, you can see things clear. You're not carrying it, you just see things clear. So I would encourage you to close it. To trust. Trust in your values. People when I when I dispute the Bible a lot of But you can't you can't come to me and dispute my life. You can't come to me and dispute what I've seen that I do in my life. Many prices paid in the places. Many. Many comforts given up, many Many uh, ideals given up, many, many self-centered dreams given up. I'm not sort of 
that sought the word of God in that church. And there's no way to be forgiven with another person who bases my faith, bases my faith on experience. I base my, my faith on when my experience aligns itself with the word of God. So let's hear me. Two more reasons. Never worship. Mm -hmm. okay. So Father God, I just pray that you when you turn our eyes towards you, that you set it upon me, man, that you in spite of us, Father God, just, just leave us. In spite of our resistance, our stubbornness, and our fighting, I pray that you that you just break through that. As gentle, as violent as you need to just break through that and, and lead us to those green pastures where we can find grace <coughs> in all circumstances. You know that, that value of death that, that David talks about for God, and yet he says he's at peace. He doesn't feel, so he's at peace. He can sit in the middle of a war and eat his supper because you set the table so he knows it's time. He knows you pray. I thank you for God. The word says that you go before us. It says that you are a real God. It says that you hedge us in and you watch over us. Jesus, and it says it either way. So there's no angle, Father God, where you don't cover Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>